Hi everyone, how's it going? Um, this video will be a tutorial on how to use the carbon chemistry software co 2 sys for Excel. Um, it will not be an introduction on, on carbonate chemistry, so really only about how to use this software tool to con constrain the carbonate chemistry in seawater. So the first thing you need to do is um, download this Excel macro. So just Google for co 2 sys and Excel. And the first link uh, will be this one, will be the right one. So you just um, need to download uh, CO2 is here. So I've already done this. Um, when you open the, the Excel macro, obviously you need Excel for this to work. You need to click Enable Macros, otherwise it won't start. Um, okay, so the first, the first page you start off with is this input section. So this is really important. You need um, to set up your the constants, the common chemistry constants you want to use for your calculations, and a couple of other parameters. Um, I come to back to that in a sec, but just start with the common chemistry constants. I usually use the ones by Luker et al. 2000 because they are currently the recommended ones. Um, but you have to be careful. They are only valid for a certain temperature and salinity range. So in this case, they are valid from a salinity from 19 to 43 and a temperature from 2 to 35 degrees. If you are working in, in for example, low salinity environments such as estuaries or the Baltic Sea, you need to use other um, um, constants. So, for example, the ones by Milero, um, they are valid to a salinity down to uh, 0 0.1. Okay, but we will use the ones by Lücker for our calculations. Um, so KHSO4 pra, um, constants, currently the ones that are recommended are the ones by Dixon and for Boron it's the one by Abström. Um, if you want to know more about, uh, with, about the constant and, 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 all the, and all the testing of them, I advise you to read this paper, it's open access and yeah, there you will find a lot of information about constants. So another important thing, really, really important actually, is um, to set up the right pH scale. Um, in marine chemistry, we typically use the total scale because it's the scale at which um, pH is measured usually. So when it's measured spectrophotometrically, it's measured on the total scale. Um, but you may also want to use the free scale for certain physiological um, questions. So um, yeah, if you want to find out more about pH scales and uh, the carbonate chemistry in, in general, I uh, recommend reading this book. It's really the carbonate chemistry bible. It will have basically all important information which uh, you need um, to, to, to understand the carbonate chemistry in seawater. Right, okay, um, so let us use the total scale for our calculations, for our, um, examples and um, move on to the to the data section. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say, if you want to have some additional information about a couple of, of these things, um, about alkalinity and so on, you can also have a look here, but it's, it's, it's rather incomplete. So as I said, I recommend reading this book in case you want to really understand what's going on. So um, let's go to the data section now. Um, and let us, for the first uh, example, assume we are designing an experiment, an ocean acidification experiment, where we incubate um, phytoplankton at, at different uh, carbonate chemistry conditions to, to check how they respond, how, how their growth responds to different carbonate chemistry conditions. So let's assume we go out into the field, collect a batch of water, of natural seawater, and this natural seawater has a salinity of um, uh, 36. Um, our temperature um, we want to use in our experiment, let's say we have a temperature of 20 degrees. Um, we are doing our experiments in bottles, so there will be no hydrostatic pressure really on, um, in, this, in, in this experiment. So we, have we add zero here. We want the phytoplankton to grow, so we add a bit of um, phosphorus, let's say 2 micromoles per kilogram, and because we are working with diatoms, um, we add a bit of silicic acid or um, silicate. Um, so let's assume we add 20 micromoles of silicic acid. Um, you can forget for the moment about this output conditions column. Um, 
this comes in another example um, we do afterwards. Um, so we just repeat um, the same values we had for the input conditions again here. So 20 degrees and um, zero hydrostatic pressure. So now this is important. You need to set up your carbonate chemistry. As I said, we do an ocean acidification experiment and in every good experiment you need a control. And for this we do um, present day atmospheric PCO2. Sorry, I forgot to say. Um, the FCO, FCO2 is so the fugacity of CO2 and the partial pressure of CO2, PCO2. It's really basically the same number. Um, this is for a real gas and this is for an ideal gas. We typically use PCO2. So um, we use this in our example as well. So we have a control, so present day atmospheric CO2. And we use a, a, a mean um, oceanic total alkalinity as our second input variable. Of course, we always need two input variables um, to constrain the carbonate system. So we use uh, 2350 in, in, in this case. Um, okay, and then we uh, simulate a high PCO2 treatment. So we let's assume we use a moderately increased PCO2 of 500 microatmospheres and a more extreme treatment of 1000 microatmospheres. Um, the total alkalinity on the time scales of ocean acidification stays the same. So we um, take the same alkalinity for all three treatments. And we also um, s um, keep the temperature and the pressure and everything the same among um, the treatments. So we have these um, three conditions. And so the next thing you do is calculate the carbonate chemistry. So you press the start button. And the first thing the software will ask you, are you sure you have added, entered everything rightly? And, and then of course we have, we press yes. And then the second thing, um, do you want to calculate auxiliary data? And we say yes, because we want all the data we can have. Um, if you press no, you will only get some basic var variables. So let's press yes. And here you get your, your carbonate system. So again, we have our input variables. We have our input uh, total alkalinity and our input PCO2. And um, for example, our calculated values would, for example, be pH. So this is this one here. And we also get the Revell factor and all sorts of things. So omega, really useful. So the output uh, conditions, because we set up the same thing as in the input conditions, will just be exactly the same. So these values will be exactly the same as these values. Right? Okay. So um, this is for designing an ocean acidification experiment. So you basically know everything, the whole carbonate chemistry in your bottles um, once you've done this calculation. So let's go to another example. And in this case, we assume we were out on an oceanic voyage and we took a sample, a carbon chemistry sample from the deep Atlantic, somewhere at, let's say, 1000 meters depth. And then we, we with a CTD, we pulled up the sample and measured uh, the carbonate chemistry conditions in the lab. So what we want to know are the in situ carbonate chemistry conditions at a thousand meters depth. But the problem is we measured it in the lab obviously at different pressure and temperature conditions. So we need to account for this. And this is why we have this output conditions um, column. So the first thing we set up is, is our salinity again. So let's assume at a thousand meters in the Atlantic, we have 35.5 salinity. Um, then we are in the lab. So we measure at 25 degrees um, Celsius. We have zero hydrostatic pressure, of course. We have um, phosphorus concentrations down there of, let's say, two micromoles again, and silicate um, concentrations of um, 25 maybe. And now this is important. We have the output conditions, which are the in situ conditions. So obviously it's much colder down there than in our lab. So we would have, for example, a temperature of five degrees at a thousand meter step, and we would have a lot of hydrostatic pressure. So we would we be at 1000 meters depth, which is roughly equivalent to 1000 decibars because one decibar is one meter approximately. It's pretty, it's pretty much the same. If you want to be really exact, you need to do a conversion here, but um, for example, this should be sufficient. So then in the lab, we have measured total alkalinity 
let's say we have measured um, 2360 micromoles per kilogram and the second parameter would be for example uh, TCO2 which is the same as um, also known as DIC dissolved inorganic carbon which is basically uh, the sum of CO2 concentration, bicarbonate concentration and carbonate concentration. Let's assume we have measured um, 2200 uh, micromoles per kilogram. Yeah, and then we can do our calculation. So again, we press start. Yes, we have entered everything correctly. Yes, we want auxiliary data. And so this is the output. So um, for the input conditions, so for our lab, so for um, conditions measured in the lab, um, we have a very, very different um, pH, for example, than in the, in the field, right? So in the, under in-situ conditions, where is it? It's here. Under in-situ conditions, we would have um, a way higher pH than we have measured in the lab. So this is really, really, um, really important. So the in-situ conditions, which you are probably interested in, are um, the results from the output column. And that's why um, CO2 has these two columns. So this is really helpful um, to fasten the um, assessment. Um, yeah, and I think with these two examples, you should get a, a good insight on how this works. And yeah, I hope this video helped. Thanks.